What is happening, everybody? Welcome to Off the Rails, a recovery podcast dedicated to ending the stigma of addiction through open discussion on all things recovery related. My name is Mark, and with me today is Dave. And today we have a very special guest joining us. His name is Sergio Mirandin. And Sergio, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks, Sergio. So like Mark was saying before, usually we have, uh, you know, we release an episode once a week with our guests just sharing their story. And uh, so we're so happy that you could take the time to join us. And uh, we'll get started now. So where are you from? Where, where were you born? And uh, where'd you grow up? All that good stuff? Um, yeah, no problem. Uh, born and raised in Toronto, in the suburbs of Etobicoke. Uh, I'm an only child of uh, Italian immigrants. Uh, I was adopted um, and uh, grew up in Etobicoke. And coincidentally, I, I actually live in the house that I grew up in today, right now, with oh, my right. wife and my dad. Yeah. So uh, everything came full circle. Awesome, man. So how was life growing up in uh, in Toronto? Um, You know what? Like, where I grew up in the suburbs, we were the only Italian people on the block for a while. Like, uh, probably till about, I was about nine or ten, we were the only Italian family. So growing up with a name like Sergio, I, I kind of stood out, right? There was you know, like John, Ball, Pop, Bill, you know, guys like that. And then there was Sergio, right? So I, I kind of stood out in a little way. You know, my parents had accents. Theirs didn't. Uh, we certainly cooked different foods. They didn't. But I, I think the biggest thing for me was as a child, I, I had a very bad stutter. Um, so that was a, a definite uh, hindrance with me. It wasn't so bad, like, with the kids in the neighborhood. They never really bothered me about it, like, playing with the kids in the neighborhood. It's when I went to school. When I started going to school, man, the rules changed quick, you know, and kids can be ruthless, right? So there was a lot of there was a lot of bullying. There was a lot of teasing and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it just – I hated school because of it, right? It was like sending me off to school was like sending me off to a to a torture camp, right? It, it, I, I already knew what – was going to go on but you know the minute i sat down right so that was uh th that was a little bit brutal um my dad was the type of guy that tried to in integrate me into everything else that everybody else everybody else kids were doing so i i played a lot of hockey baseball football lacrosse like my dad tried to get me into every sport going right always wanted me to play soccer i never wanted anything to do with soccer right so that was a kind of a, a downfall for my dad but uh other than that, growing up in the in the neighborhood that I grew up in, with the people that I grew up with, it was all pretty normal, you know. Like it was, uh, I don't think anything really stood out in our neighborhood, or it was any different than any other suburb in the city of Toronto, really. Sergio, I had a quick question there. Um, did that like negative experience with school? Did that kind of want to, like deter you from wanting to try the things that your your dad wanted you to do, say like soccer or hockey or anything? Oh, absolutely. Right. I, I didn't want anything to do with it. Right. Because I knew that I'd have to talk to other kids. I knew that I would have to integrate with them and stuff like that. And and I knew that maybe not all, but somebody was going to tease me about my stutter. Right. That definitely something was going to go on. Right. So I, I knew that before I even attempted it. Right. So that was always kind of like, oh, I, I, I don't want this. Right. But my dad was pretty persistent. And uh good on him because uh, it, it certainly helped me later on in life the funny thing is uh my grandparents immigrated to canada right around the time that i went to school and uh my grandfather kind of saw me coming home upset crying you know uh pulling pulling in words and stuff like that and he actually uh, pulled me into the garage one day and taught me how to fight and said like when they start teasing you this is what you do you start swinging for the fences right and that to me was, it was a game changer, right? It, it, it soon became known like, you know, don't tease the stuttering kid because he's a little, he's a little high strung. <laughs> he's a little wigged out too. So, you know, unless you want, unless you want the fist to be flying, just leave him be. Mm -hmm. And that just, that taught me a huge lesson, right? And I didn't know it at the time, but that kind of like forged a whole new mantra for me in the way that I dealt with my life was I, I was going to get you way before you ever got a chance to get me right mm -hmm. so it was like you know I, I'm going to build up my walls and I'm going to push back way before you get a chance to push so you learn you learn how to throw throw the uh 
throw the fists around. How did how did things go after that with, with school uh, as you kind of continue to get older? I, 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 I never liked school, right? I, I was always a daydreamer. I'd, I'd be the kid looking out the window wanting to be doing other stuff. But, you know, if you threw me on a baseball diamond or on a hockey rink and stuff, I was fine, right, doing my own thing. But to, to sit me down and get me to study and to, to read and do all that, oh, I wanted nothing to do with it, right? I just, I just found it so boring and, yeah, could care less about school. I went because I had to, certainly not because I wanted to. And the other thing is, to my parents, education was everything, right? Because they, they didn't get a chance to get an education, especially my mother, right? Um, she really wanted me to, you know, to grow on, go on university and, and all that stuff, right? And get like a degree, which was like, you know, everything in her eyes. And I wanted nothing to do with it, right? So it, 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 it laid ground for a good battlefield between me and my parents right from the get-go, because they were all about getting educated, not having to, you know, to work construction or do manual labor, which my d dad was doing and stuff like that. My mom thought, you know, if you could get a good profession with a degree and stuff like that, you're set in life, right? And I wanted nothing to do with it. Sergio, was there any, um, so growing up, were you around any like substance abuse or, or anything like that? Oh, yeah, there, it was, you know, it was the 70s, right? Uh, going into the early 80s. So, like, there was drugs everywhere. You know, all the older kids were smoking pot and doing something, right, and, you know, dropping acid and whatnot. Like, we all knew it. Like, a lot of my friends had older brothers and sisters, and they were all partying, and, and we knew what was going on. The thing is that there was such a generation gap between us and our parents, right? A lot of the parents didn't really know what was going on, but we certainly did, and you caught on real quick to you know, and you gravitated towards the people that were partying. At least I did, right? And all my friends did. You know, you you, you quickly find the people that that you mesh well with, right? Mm, absolutely. So, what age did that kind of start for you? That whole uh, party scene. Uh, or you know what? The, fir the first time I drank, and I can't even tell you why how this came about. But me and a buddy of mine stole half a gallon of my dad's homemade red wine. We might have been 12 years old and went out to the local park and uh, tried our best to finish it off, right? And I remember coming to it about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning on like a Sunday, right? Just covered in purple puke, right? And knowing that I was in a world of trouble, right? Like once I got home, like that I was in deep trouble once I got home. And I, I can't even explain it to you today but I couldn't wait to do it again. I couldn't tell you why. I couldn't tell you what it was that went on, right? Because I, I really don't remember my first drunk. It was a complete blackout. Uh, but I couldn't wait to do it again. And, and from that moment on, from about 12, 13, every chance I got, I was either drinking or smoking some weed or doing something, right? And that's how it just started with me. Did the homemade wine, uh, homemade oh. Italian wine, at least keep you away from, from doing that again? <laughs> I never never touched it again yeah <laughs> never touched it again yeah that was my one and one and done never drank wine again drank everything else but never touched wine again so at that age um was it like a uh i guess like a weekend thing or or how was oh how yeah was yeah it was just like weekends and stuff like that especially once we got into high school like you know people are having parties on the weekends and stuff and you become the weekend warrior right mm -hmm. and uh and, and that's pretty much how it started you know sometimes we'd go out during the week me and my buddies would hook up and stuff go out to the local park maybe you know smoke a couple of joints drop some mushrooms or whatever right and uh and stuff like that but it was pretty pretty much weekend stuff at that point in time Looking back now, uh, do you remember when you were that age? I think we've kind of talked before about like signs that maybe you potentially have an issue, uh, like blacking out. Like you said, your first time blacking out. Did you black out often when you drank? Yeah. Or did you also like always want to like kind of keep it going where other people were kind of shutting it down? Always, yeah. always. I, I blacked out often, right? And uh, my nickname was Weebles, right? Weebles wobbles, but they don't fall down. Right. And uh, so, uh, you know, when when your nickname at 15, 16 is Weevils, like you might have an issue. Right. And I was always the guy that just wanted to keep the party going, never wanted to go home, never wanted to shut it down. Right. 
And uh, yeah, more was always better in, in my in my books. There was never a point where I could. I, I can honestly say I don't think I've ever drank socially in my life. Like it was always for the effect. It was never for the taste or just to hang out and, you know, and, and socialize with people. It was always let's get it on. Let's get messed up. That was always my mentality. How did it uh, kind of progress from there? Oh, um, I had some older cousins that were uh, in a motorcycle club. We'll say motorcycle club. <laughs> and uh, they quickly taught me that uh, instead of buying it, it would be a lot more profitable for me to sell it. Right. Uh, so by about 16, that's what I was doing. And that's how I made my living up until uh, till I got sober. Uh, so, you know, my attitude just got worse and worse and worse, right? Because I was making all sorts of money. You know, I'm looking at my parents, you know, working these these jobs. My dad's working on a construction site. And I'm making what he's making in a week, like in three or four days part time, right? And so, like, you, you couldn't tell me anything. I, I knew it all. I had all the answers. I didn't know any of the questions. Right. So my my attitude was was really sliding off the scales, you know, at that point in time in my life, by about 16, 17, 18 years old, I was already in trouble. Like By 18, I had a serious drinking problem. I, I was not only just drinking on the weekends, I was drinking during the week as well and going to going to school hungover and stuff like that. So, yeah, the, things were definitely not going well. So was it like, uh, was it affecting your like attendance at school or were you getting in trouble or anything at school because of it? I was always in trouble at school, always in trouble. Right. Um, I was a, I was a decent athlete. Right. So, uh, you know, the high school that I went to was, uh, was big into hockey and I was a decent player. So that, you know, that gave me some leeway, but I was always down in the office for, for something right we were always cutting class and skipping school and you know going out and partying or just hanging out at someone's house and stuff like that it was definitely starting to cause some problems right i remember at 17 being brought home by metro cops because i was hammered out of my mind on a wednesday night right and they just dropped me off at my parents place and stuff like that right and my mom just being absolutely infuriated right but uh yeah the, things were definitely not going well right especially compared to like the rest of my family. I'm an only child, but I got a bunch of cousins that, you know, that live in the area as well, right? And they were all doing well at school and weren't causing any problems at home. And then, then there was me, right? So. Now did your, your parents uh, or any family members when you're kind of in that stage recognize that maybe you have an issue and try to help you with that? Or was it more just kind of pushing, the, um, continue to push the education? You know, I, I don't really think that my parents knew what I was doing because I was rarely home, right? Like, I never did any of the stuff around the house, right? It was just occasionally, like, you know, there would be an issue about me drinking too much on a weekend or something like that, right? So I, I think in their mind, they were probably thinking he's just going through a phase, like maybe this will just straighten itself out. But I really don't think, you know, and uh, and I've had some conversations with my parents afterwards, right? They didn't know how big of a problem it was like i kept it really well hidden you, you know um so i i can't really say that anyone ever reached out to me and tried to say hey listen you know things might be a problem here and stuff like that there was this one girl that i dated in high school for a period of time right i remember her mom saying to me one time right that uh you might have uh some substance abuse problems and i was like nah i don't have any substance abuse problems everything is good right and she was just like yeah things are not good they're sunshine and uh and i think she persuaded her daughter to uh to leave me by the roadside real quick so it, it was it was becoming an issue right and and um in my household not so much right things weren't apparent yet uh but yeah th th things were definitely spiraling out of control at that point in time so sergio after high school or school, uh, what does it start looking like then? Um, so after I graduated high school by the skin of my teeth, my dad basically said to me, there's there's two things, pal. You're either going to get a full-time job or you're going to continue your, your education, one or the other. You're not just going to hang around at the house doing nothing, right? So I thought, well, I'm not getting a job <laughs> with that. So I, I went to Humber College, right, and uh, just went to community college. 
and to me it was just like a high school with ashtrays that had a bar on campus it was it was party land right i barely went to class nobody was taking attendance nobody cared what you did so i was just partying in the bar and that's when things really went off the rails for me right uh i started to uh i got introduced to cocaine and uh and that was like a real eye opener i was like wow where's this stuff been all my life um and things just really spiraled out of control. Like then my drinking was daily, right? Uh, as, along with other substances. And, and that's when things really began to become problematic, right? Because it would be nothing for me to just vanish for three days, not phone my parents. And you got to remember, this is way before cell phones, right? So like I, I wouldn't pick up the call, phone and say, listen, I'm just at a buddy's place or whatever. Like I, I would just go MIA for two or three days and then just roll in the door, right? like nothing like i own the place so yeah things were definitely definitely getting out of control at that point in time so i'd be about 20 21 22 at this point in time right and things are not going well in my life do you, you end up finishing the the education there or you just no, kinda, no yeah no not even kinda, close i kind of yeah. guess maybe that's one. yeah yeah not even close i was there for two and a half years i think i managed four credits Right. Yeah. So like, no, no, no education there whatsoever. Sergio, Just a different type of education. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sergio, did it get to the point where you um, like with drinking and cocaine, you couldn't do one without the other? Yeah. 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 One went hand in hand. Right. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It was just like, uh, yeah, that was my. Uh, by this time, like I, I'm drinking first thing in the morning, because if I didn't, I'd, I'd be shaking like a leaf. Right. So I'd fire down a couple of drinks and then, uh, you know, that would kind of like settle things down and then, you know, maybe smoke a joint, snort a line. And then, uh, then I'm ready for the day. You know, then I'm okay. I, I'm ready to, uh, to take things on. So right around this time, uh, I got arrested for the first time for impaired driving, right? Uh, my first one just got pulled over one night because I was always drinking and driving. Everybody that I knew was drinking and driving. Like, Honestly, all the guys that I used to hang out with and run with at, at one point in time, I think each and every one of them has been charged with impaired driving at least once. Like it was so common back then in the late 80s, early 90s. It's like everybody was drinking and driving. It, it was nothing. Uh, so I got arrested the first time and uh, nothing changed, right? Just hired a lawyer, handed them paperwork and said, yeah, you take care of this and, and just continued on. And then I came home one day and uh, there were some suitcases packed and my dad sitting in the kitchen. I'm thinking, this is a little odd. And I remember asking him, I go, are you and mom going on vacation or going on a trip? He says, no. I said, well, then uh, who's going on a trip? He said, you are. I said, really? I said, wow, where am I going? He says, I could care less as long as it's not here. Leave your key on the table and get out. Like he had just had enough at this point in time, right? Just had enough. So uh, I was like, wow, now what do I do? So I remember uh, packing up and uh, grabbing my suitcases, throwing them in my car. And right in Etobicoke, right along Lakeshore Boulevard and Parkland, there used to be all these really seedy motels at, at one point in time. They've all been torn down now. That's all condominiums. But at one point, there was all these really like deadbeat hotels, all sorts of stuff going on. So I moved in there for about a month, right, and just gave them 30 of my drunkest days. And uh, started to plan my new life, and uh, and got kicked out of those. Got finally got kicked out of that motel. I think I lit a room on fire or something like something went on. Right, it was just a debacle. Right, so when you get kicked out of these hotels, like things are not going well. So I gathered up three or four of my buddies, and we decided we'd rent a house out in Mississauga, and that's what we did. And just it just became an absolute circus. How long? Uh... Were you out Mississauga with the, with those guys before? Ten months. We lasted ten months before we got kicked out. We forgot what you needed to pay rent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of important when you're renting a house. So we uh, there was four of us. <laughs> oh, I was such a mess. So there was four of us living in this house. Obviously, I'm not hanging out with you know IBM executives, right? These are guys that are just like me. Right. And in fact, uh, the sad truth is, out of all those guys, I'm the only one that's still alive. I buried the last one of those guys uh, when I was 35. So that was 20 years ago. Um, 
so yeah, we uh, we all moved into this house and uh, just turned this whole neighborhood into an absolute circus, right? The house was going 24 hours a day. People were coming and going and, you know, it was just an absolute mess. Uh, we ended up getting kicked out of there. And just before we got kicked out of there, I managed to get myself uh, arrested again for impaired driving twice in the same day by the same policeman. So that's how well things were going. I got arrested twice for impaired driving by the same cop in the same day. I've only heard ask... one other person that that's happened to. Well, yeah. That's... Now you've now you've heard now, two. Now I, now I know two. Yeah, like honestly, if it was today, I would have been locked up and they would have thrown away the key. Right? It was just a different era, right? But it, it, obviously, it was still not a good thing, right? But it was just an absolute circus. But yeah, twice in the same day by the same guy. And then, like a month and a half later, we're getting evicted out of this house. So, like, yeah, my my life is an absolute sideshow at this point in time, and my so, dog's coming in to say hello. Uh, so, where do you uh, where do you end up after getting kicked out of there? Oh, I do what I always do. I phone mom, right? When in doubt, phone mom, right? So I phoned my mom and uh, you know, kind of coerced her into allowing me to to slide back into the house. And she said, if it's okay with your dad, it's okay with me. So. I had a conversation with my dad and, you know, I made him all sorts of promises that I wasn't going to keep and uh, moved back into my parents' place and, you know, took up residence in the basement. And then probably about, oh, I'd have to say maybe about two months after that, I was involved in a high-speed chase, uh, impaired driving again, uh, that made city TV news. And uh, ended up in the West End Detention Center because of it, and that's and that's where my my story really begins. So how how did you end up in the chase? I'm excited <laughs> for this one. Uh, hanging out with my buddies, yeah. right? We're uh, we're bar hopping. Okay. Uh, um, I just uh, just met up with my Connect, yeah. so I had all sorts of stuff in the in the trunk of my car. Uh, had a loaded handgun in the trunk of my car as well and uh, turn a corner. And the next thing I know, uh, the lights are on behind me. And I thought, yeah, not today. Not pulling over today. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Literally had a, had a, had a beer can in between my legs. My, my buddy's like rolling a joint and he's just like, go man, go. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not stopping. <laughs> so, and it just, it just got really out of control. Right. It, by the time it ended, there was like 15 cruisers involved, you know, like where they had finally blockaded me in. It looked like Las Vegas. There was just like flashing lights everywhere. Right. And uh, I remember getting out of the car and just showing them the beer. I knew I was done. Right. I finished the beer, threw it on the ground and literally put my hands on top of the car. Right. Just said, OK, whatever. Like, I'm done. What was it matter now? And ended up in the West End Detention Center. So what does that look like there for you now? By this time, I'm 25 years old. I'm 25 at this point in time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, thankfully, they didn't charge my buddy with anything. Uh, they just charged me with, what didn't they charge me with? That's the shorter list, right? And I'm now in the West End Detention Center because, because the charges are so close together. They consider me like a repeat offender and a danger to public safety. So in the West End Detention Center, I go. And by about day three, I'm starting to get sick. Uh, like I, I'm going through the DTs. Uh, I'm sweating, shaking. Like things are coming out of me at both ends. And like I, 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 I'm in big trouble in the West. And, and I remember sitting in my cell uh, one night just thinking like, I will do anything. Just get me out of this situation. And I never want to feel like this again. Again, I will do anything. Just get me out of here. And about 12 days later, my mom came to see me. How did that visit go? Oh, it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. She had just watched her son on City TV News. Everybody in the neighborhood knew it, right? Knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we're sitting there, plexiglass, talking on the phone. I'm in this orange jumpsuit. I, I look like death warmed over, right? And my mom is just devastated, right? Like, you know, she's devastated and, and angry, 
you know, and, and really angry. What I didn't know was uh, my mom had been talking to my neighbor while I was in the West End Detention Center. And this guy, uh, I didn't know a lot about this guy. I knew he worked for Bell Canada, but I knew I didn't like him. He was really weird. He was always happy. You know, he'd say weird things to me like, how are you today? How's life going? <laughs> like, I didn't like this dude. What I didn't know is this guy was 17 years sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he had talked to my mom and kind of said to her, you know, your kid might be an alcoholic and he might have some substance abuse problems. And if you want, I'll talk to him when he gets out, if he gets out. It's up to you, right? So my mom comes to see me and, you know, I'm saying to her, hey, you got to get me out of here. Like, this this place is not good, right? She's just like, okay, that's nice. She's like, like, what are you willing to do? And I'm like, we'll, we'll talk about it when I get out. My mom's like, no, no, I'm here now. We can talk right now. What are you willing to do? So, you know, the jig's kind of up, right? Like my back's up against the wall and I'm saying like, all right, what do you want me to do? And she goes, I want you to do something about your drinking and your drug problem. And I'm like, yeah, we're not going to talk about that stuff. And my mom just started hanging up. Don't you? Cause then good luck. Right. And I was like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Let's, let's not get too hasty here. I said, okay. I said, whatever you need me to do, I'll do. Right. And, and honestly, I, I knew then it was a lie. I knew I was lying to my mom right then and there. So she bailed me out a couple of days later. A buddy of mine drove her to the West End Detention Center to pick me up because my dad was so fed up, he wouldn't even drive my mom there. He said, no, I'm not wasting the gas to go get him. And uh, and when I came home, my next door neighbor was sitting in my living room. And I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me. Not this. <laughs> Anything but this. How did that, uh, how'd that chat go with him? Uh, I didn't want to have the chat, no, right? No. I, 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 I remember walking in, just looking at my mom and say, and saying to her, I'm not in the mood for this. And my mom just held up my bail papers and she goes, I could care less what kind of mood you're in. Sit down. <laughs> now you got to remember I'm six foot three, 200, about 210 pounds, right? My mother was about five foot one, maybe 105 pounds, but like she was furious at this point in time, right? Just like not happy and i thought you know what we'll just sit down and play the game right see what this guy has to say and i had no idea what he was going to talk to me about i thought he was going to tell me to join a church or who knows what right and uh that's not exactly what happened at all uh yeah when he like um i guess i guess he probably told you that he was in recovery hey did that kind of yeah did that kind of make you i guess more he, a bit more open-minded he did it really subtly, right? He, he told me about his life, right? Yeah. Uh, he, he gave me a little background on his life and how, you know, told me how one time he was living under a bridge, right? And uh, and then he tried to take his own life and stuff like that. And uh, and I'm thinking, come on, man, look at what, where are we going with this, right? And then he rolled up his sleeve and he showed me the scars, right? And then he hit me with it, right? You know, that he was in recovery. And I didn't know what that meant, Right. And then he said those fateful words. He goes, yeah, he goes, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me, man. Anything but this. I didn't know anything about AA. I just knew people didn't drink there, right? And I knew, knew I didn't want to be a part of that. <laughs> yeah. When so, you look yeah. back at it now, do you consider that like him kind of planting a seed? Oh, big time. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. He, he took me to a meeting the very next day. Oh, wow. Right? Because he asked me if I wanted to go to a meeting. And, of course... I didn't, right? But I'm, I, I'm, I'm peering into the kitchen at my new warden, right? And she's glaring at me. So I'm like, yeah, let's do it, man. Let's go to a meeting. Oh yeah, I'm pumped, right? I wanted nothing to do with it, right? But uh, yeah, so he took me to a meeting the very next day, and uh, and at that meeting, I basically the guy that spoke at that meeting basically told my story, verbatim, like told my life story. And of course, in my twisted mind, it, this is all a setup, right? Like they they got this guy specially for me, and like just like craziness, right? Mm -hmm. You know. But could I relate with this guy? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And that's how it basically began for me. So that stick for you right there, like you you stopped drinking, or did it uh, take a little uh, longer, a little longer than that? No, no, no. I no. Um, the night I got arrested was was the last drink and, and drug that I ever did, but uh, that wasn't the plan, right? That was not the plan. The plan was to let some heat die off, and then I could slowly, you know, get back into my my life, right? 
at that first meeting that I went to, there was a couple of young guys around my age and stuff like that. And I, I vaguely remember giving my telephone number to a guy, right? So when I came home from that first meeting, my mom asked me how it was and stuff. And I said, oh, it was fantastic. And she goes, are you going to go again? I said, yeah. Ma. I said, when they meet again next month, I'm going again, right? So I thought I had bought myself like 30 days. <laughs> so I'm out the next day buying cigarettes and a guy calls and tells my mom how many meetings there are on the GTA on a daily basis. Like, you know, how often they meet. And then he would be more than happy to take me to all of them. But dude, let me tell you, when I walked into my house, my mom was beyond raging, like beyond, because like, you know, again, I, I'm playing games with her. Right. And she just said like, you know, I don't know what you think you're doing with your life. She goes, but this guy's coming to pick you up at seven o'clock and you better be ready. Right. And that's basically how I started to go to meetings on a regular basis. Right. It, it wasn't my plan. Like I thought I, you know, dodged a bullet for about 30 days, you know, and could start to, to work my life back in and again. But that's not how it happened at all. So this guy started to take me and we're, we're still good friends today. This, the same guy that's, you know, that came to pick me up the very next day at seven o'clock. We're still good friends today. And he took me to every single meeting that there are in Octobico for the next three months begrudgingly. Yeah, that is awesome. Do you remember there being a point where you you kind of start enjoying the meetings? Well, that took a while. Yeah, that took a. I, I was not one of those guys that was happy to be in AA. <laughs> like I, yeah, I, I was not. I was not happy to be there. Right. But the other part was I was in so much legal trouble. Right. Like I was in and out of court and stuff like that, and I was terrified of being thrown back in the West End Detention Center again. Right. Like there were so many bail conditions. Um, I had a curfew. I had a certain area that I that I had to be in and stuff like that. So, like just going to meetings and just hiding out in my house was pretty pretty much okay at that point in time. Like, did I want this to be the rest of my life? No, absolutely. But I I was in a lot of trouble, right? So, I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't feel like going back in, into the West End Detention Center. So, I think it probably took me about four or five months until I started to become comfortable in the rooms. Right. And I think, uh, I think I was probably about six or seven months sober by the time I actually spoke at a discussion meeting, like at a closed discussion meeting, I'd been to lots of them, but I would just sit there and just pass, pass, pass like just angry, right? Like just not happy. I have a sponsor that's like that today. So. Oh, I get it. I guess back then too, part of the, like your charges, like what you were doing, that wasn't even any of the conditions, right? Going to meetings or anything? Or was no, it? surprisingly yeah. not. Like nothing on my bail conditions said that I had to abstain from alcohol and, uh, you know, that I couldn't go to bars or that I had to go to an AA meeting. Uh, part of my bail conditions were that I couldn't drive. Like I, I could not, I couldn't even hold on to car keys. And in fact, if, if I was in a car, I had to be in the back seat. So even when this guy used to pick me up to meetings, I had to sit in the back like driving Miss Daisy. Like, it was ridiculous, right? Like, when I think about it now, I'm thinking, like, how, how could you not have that part of my bail conditions? Like, how could you not? Like, obviously, there's a problem here, right, with this many charges. But, hey, I wasn't the judge. So how, how did recovery go from there, Sergio? So I think it was about six or seven months sober and I started working construction with my dad, right? Because my dad was like, yeah, you're not just hanging out in the house and going to these meetings at night. Like that life's over, right? So I started working construction with my dad, which was not going well because there was a lot of tension between me and my dad, right? Like a lot. So um, I think I worked with my dad for about a year, right? Um, so that was really pleasant, right? Waking up at five o'clock in the morning, going to work construction with him and then coming home and, you know, the dead silence in the car ride in the morning and the dead silence in the car ride at night. And then I couldn't wait to get out to a meeting just to get away from him. Right. By this time, I had joined a group. Right. Uh, oh, I should tell you how I picked my first sponsor. This is almost comical. So <laughs> I see this guy in the room that never talks to me, never, never comes around me and stuff. And I said, that's the guy. That's the guy that'll be, I'm going to ask that dude right there. Cause he's not going to bother me. So perfect. So I asked this guy 
to be my sponsor. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. No problem. I'm like, okay, cool. He goes, you got to call me every day. We're going to go to meetings together three times a week. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, what have I done? Right. Why this guy? Like, how did this guy come to life all of a sudden? Right. So best thing for me though. Right. So I'm now phoning this guy every day. We're talking, we're going to meetings together about three, four times a week. And, you know, and things are starting to change. Like I, I'm starting to get a little bit more comfortable uh, my head's not racing anymore. Like, you know, um, still have the compulsion to drink. That, that hasn't left me. Um, and, and that didn't leave me well past a year, right? Well past a year. But uh, but I'm not drinking. Um, you know, my lawyer's taking care of a few of the charges and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm still in and out of a courtroom all the time, working and, you know, just going to meetings and just trying to figure life out. Right. Just trying to figure me out, which is a lot of work on a good day. So how long uh, so you start uh, hammering all the, out all the steps in AA and kind of going through that? Oh, yeah. Step work. Ooh, we don't want to get into that. That's uh, that's crazy. Yeah. We're not doing that stuff. So I'd gotten a one year medallion. Uh, both my parents came to it. Uh, even my dad came and I, I remember when I sat down from picking up my medallion, my la- my dad leaned over and he grabbed my arm and he said to me, he goes, I'm proud of you and I love you. Never heard that from my dad once in my life, right? Never heard that at all. Shortly after that, I started dating someone. So I'm working. A few of the charges have gone away and I'm starting to go to less and less meetings, right? I'm barely going to them at all. And then by about a year and a half, I'm not going to any because I'm busy with this relationship. I'm busy with work and life is good again. So we don't need this stuff. And within a month of stopping meetings, I found myself so crippled with anxiety and uh, just remorse, guilt, you name it. It was all balled up inside of me. You have to remember, I haven't done any step work at all, like nothing, zero. I found myself just absolutely paralyzed in my mom's basement. And uh, I was at the point uh, one night where I was literally uh, trying to build up the courage to uh, blow my brains out with a gun. I had stuck a gun in my mouth and I was just hoping that I could get the courage to just end my life. That's where I was at. And the phone rang. Uh, and for whatever reason, I answered the phone and it was a friend of mine, this woman, uh, uh, from my home group who asked me, uh, where have you been? What are you doing? And I said, oh man, you really don't want to know what I'm doing. And she goes, no, I do. And I can't even tell you today why, but I was honest with her. I, I told her that I told her the truth of what I was planning on doing. And she said, I'll be at your doorstep in five minutes. And, uh, and she was true to her word five minutes she was there and spent the rest of that evening with me in a coffee shop just talking to me and convinced me to uh get back to the meetings you know get another sponsor and to start doing some work some actual step work and and i did i went back to my home group got a new sponsor just like the other guy you know some ruthless guy that you know that was all over me and actually started to go to a ton of discussion meetings and just started doing some step work did you find, did you start taking, I guess, recovery a bit more seriously after that, Sergio? Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Um, and, and my second sponsor, um, had a very similar story to me. Right. And, uh, and I don't know if it was just, I was more ready for the message that he was delivering rather than, uh, than what the first guy was saying. Or if he just put it differently, right? But I, I just related to him more. And I I just had this sense that he wasn't trying to string me along. He wasn't trying to get anything from me. He was just trying to help me out. And, and he was just being honest with me. And he was just like, if, if you want to live any sort of contented life, this is what you're going to have to do. And, and if you're not willing to do it, stop wasting my time and stop going to meetings. And, uh, you know, and, and good luck to you, right? He goes, but you, you already know how that's going to end up. You know, a lot of times we talk about like medication and stuff like that, that you, you know, you're trying to self-medicate through all these years. Do you ever, um, 
you don't go to the doctor and get anything for anxiety or anything like that? Uh, no, just kind of, no, no, never, never did. Never, never did uh, go to the doctor. Didn't really think that there was anything that they could give me, to be honest with you. Otherwise, I probably would have, right? But uh, never, that never really crossed my mind. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I never... Never tried to go out and, and get the prescription filled or, you know, or, or, or do anything that way or, or, or see a psychologist or anything like that. That just wasn't, just wasn't in my wheelhouse to, to even contemplate that right at that point in time. So Sergio, you get, uh, you get a new sponsor, you start out the steps. Um, at this point, are the, is the court case cleared up or are you still going through that? By this point in time, the court case is cleared up, right? And, uh, I had a very good lawyer and out of all those charges, I got convicted on one. Right. So I lost my license for a year. So now I'm busting it for a period of time. And, uh, you know, but that's about it. Right. Out of all those charges. Um, yeah. A year suspension. So like, honestly, complete slap on the wrist. Like, um, I wish that I, I could say that I was grateful for that, but I, I was still kind of pissed. Right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know just a little uh just a little self-centered um so yeah so now i'm busting it and things are a little bit better because a lot of that is behind me right like i, I don't have that big cloud of impending doom or what's going to go on hanging over me anymore so i'm going to meetings things are a little bit better the compulsion to drink has finally left me you know i'm about two years sober at this time and i can honestly say i remember Clearly, I woke up on a Saturday morning one day and I was walking my dog and I thought, I can't remember the last time that I've, that I've wanted to drink. Like, I can't remember when that, that was crossing my mind, right? And it was just like, I, I can't even describe the feeling. Like, it was just, it was freedom. You know, th that's basically the, the best way to, to describe it. It was just absolute freedom. So, yeah. So, by this time, you know, about two two years in a bit i'm starting to take the program pretty seriously you know i'm active you know and i'm moving along you are you starting to add any uh other stuff into your recovery like self self-care i mean you talked about when you're younger you know not really no no not no. even close not no. yet okay. no wasn't what wasn't ready for that no 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 we, we can't do any of that stuff right that's for weak people yeah <laughs> weak people go see therapists and psychiatrists and all that stuff you know those are for crazy people i'm not crazy I, i'm an alcoholic i'm a drug addict I, I can live with that but i'm good right so i th think i was about six years sober right and i would have what i would like to say are fits of anger but they're more like fits of absolute rage just like boil up right something would go on or somebody would cut me off and i mean the rage that would come up in me would be like unbelievable right so i spoke to my sponsor and i said uh what happened was i i, I grabbed a guy and i was literally pulling a guy out of his car in a tim hortons parking lot right and the only thing that stopped me is i in the back seat there was this kid strapped in a child seat right and i literally just let the guy go and, and drove away in my car and thought like what are you doing like what the hell are you doing with your life right what, what is going on and i remember phoning my sponsor and he was a firefighter and uh he was in etobicoke and he said come by the station we'll talk right so i i used to go to the fire station all the time hang out with the guys and you know shoot the shit with my sponsor and stuff so i talked to him and i said listen man i said that this really scared me like i I'm losing, I li I'm losing my grip. Right. And he said, okay. He goes, I am going to give you a telephone number to a person to call. Right. And I want you to call this person. So he, he writes down this number and he, I said, who is this? He goes, it's a therapist. I said, no, man, I, said, I don't need a therapist. And he goes, I see one. And I was like, excuse me. And he goes, yeah, I see one. And I was like, you're kidding me. And to me, like my sponsor was a pretty tough dude, you know, firefighter, pretty you know, dominant alpha male. And I'm thinking, you see a therapist? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I do. I was like, all right, so you do. I, I will. What the hell, right? So that's how it started, right? So I, I ended up seeing this, this therapist for about a little over two years, right? And uh, we 
we dumped into a lot of the, the things that, you know, that were traumatizing for me as a kid, you know, and, uh, and what brought my anger out and stuff like that. And what, what kind of like set me off and things to watch for and things to, uh, you know, to try and ease up on and blah, blah, blah. And it worked well for a while. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Sergio, you mentioned at like your one year, your dad, you know, he said he, he was proud of you and he loved you. Um, mm -hmm. from that, like, were you able to work on your relationship with him after that? Hmm. So that's a really good question. Um, my dad's a pretty stoic guy, right? And, uh, and as I said, I, I live with my father today. He's 90. When I first came into recovery, my dad wouldn't leave his wallet in the same room as me. Would always monitor where I am in the house and stuff like that. Um, by the time I was, I'd say, 22 years sober, my mom had gotten ill. Um, we noticed that my mom was not acting like herself, right? She was forgetting a lot of things and things weren't being done around the house. And my dad was, you know, getting phone calls from companies saying like, you know, the hydro's not paid, the, the elect you know, this isn't paid, that's not paid. And my dad's like, what the hell's going on, right? So we had my mom uh, brought to a, a doctor and a specialist and stuff, and it was determined that she had early onset dementia. Coincidentally, I was selling my house at the same time. Right. So my dad said to me, why don't you move back in with us? You're single. Bank the money that you get from the house. Come in and move in with us. We could use a little bit of help. I need some help with this whole financial thing. I, I don't know how to handle any of this stuff because my mom did everything for him. Right. My dad didn't do any banking at all. And, uh, and, and you can help me with that. Right. So. Did we work on our relationship? Absolutely, right? Had things changed in our relationship? Oh, night and day, night and day. Like, just think of it. We went from like not speaking or my dad not speaking to me to my dad asking me, hey, come back into the house and help me out with this stuff. And and, and I'm going to give you the, the keys to the finances to the house and you take care of things. My dad didn't change. My dad's the same guy. I did, you know, over time, I'd showed him that I was reliable, that I was trustworthy, right? That I could be counted on when I was drinking and drugging. The only thing that you can count on is that I was going to screw things up. Right. And that I wasn't going to be where I was supposed to be, you know, but over time, and, and it took a long time with my dad, he, he trusted me enough to, uh, to say, Hey, I need a hand with stuff. And can you come back in here and, and live here and, and help me out with things? That's really, that's really awesome. Um, I find there's a element, I guess, like, you know, in recovery where when, you know, you go to treatment or something like that, you kind of, kind of expect your family to, you know, realize you're better right away, but it takes, it takes a long time to build that trust back. And I remember whining to my sponsor about this stuff, right. When, you know, like early on in recovery, right. And saying like, you know, like, he still hassles me about stuff. You know, he's still breaking my balls, blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. And my sponsor was like, dude, you drove him nuts for 25 years. I think it's <laughs> going to be like 25 minutes later. He's going to like things. <laughs> everything's golden. Yeah. Exactly. Because I've been sober for like 25 years. My dad still busts my, my balls. He goes, so like, really? He goes, get over yourself. It's not about you. It's about him. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, okay, sure. But, you know, you know what we're like, right? An addict and, a, and an alcoholic. I want it now. I don't mm -hmm. want it yesterday. And I don't want to work for it. I just I just want it. Mm -hmm. Want it on a silver platter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely things did change with my dad. Unfortunately, things never changed with my mom. My mom and I always had a very oh, combative relationship. My mother was very controlling. And uh, we all know as, as an alcoholic and an addict how much we like to be controlled. And we just came from different worlds, right? My, my mom wanted different things for me. And, and I certainly didn't want the same things that my mom wanted in life, right? And, and I didn't make it easier. I'm like, you know, I, I didn't make our relationship easier. You know, I, 
I'm covered in tattoos. You know, I had long hair. I used to ride a motorcycle, like all the things that my mother hated, right? And it just, it's like putting gas on a fire, right? It, things did not go well, right? But uh, at the end, you know, at the end of my mom's life, I was her main caregiver, right? So that's what recovery was able to give to me. I was able to give back. Sergio, I was wondering about um, some of the relationships you might have had during your active using days. And um, I think I'm assuming you had to maybe cut some of those ties. Did any of those people reach out, like the guys you said you lived with that um, uh, unfortunately have all passed now? At any point, did any of them reach out when they realized that you were in recovery and maybe they needed some some help? Or did you hear from any of them or not really? It was like I was a pariah. It's like I yeah. fell off the earth, right? The phone stopped ringing. Uh, guys didn't want to hang out with me. It's, yeah. Um, I reached out to a few of them, like when I knew that they were in trouble and stuff like that, right? Uh, trying to extend an olive branch, saying like, if you need some help, I'm here for you and stuff like that. None of them wanted any help and stuff like that. And like I said, the last one, uh, I was 35 when he died, right? That was the last one. So from like 25 to 35, four of them died. And they all died young, yeah. way before their time. And all is a direct result of this disease. Did those, like, uh, those, I guess, deaths kind of reinforce that you were kind of making the right decisions at that point in your life? Um, yeah, I, I knew at that point in time in my life that I was, that I was living the life that I was supposed to live. Right. But you know what? It was weird. It was like a double-edged sword, right? It was, it was like, as, as much as I knew that I was doing the right thing, I felt guilty, right? That I was the one that got out and that they died, right? There was, there was a big thing of guilt that I felt, right? That maybe I didn't try hard enough to help them. Maybe I didn't reach out enough. Maybe I didn't do this. Maybe I didn't do that. Right. And I remember talking to my sponsor about it at the time. Right. <clears throat> and he just said to me, he goes, if someone had reached out to you when you were in your height, would you have listened? He goes, what could they have said that they would have, the light bulb would have magically went off in your head. He goes, some of us make it, some of us don't. It's the reality of it. It's the unfortunate reality, but not all of us make it to recovery. Not all of us get to get clean and sober. A lot of people die of this disease. Absolutely. So what, so what does life look for, like for you these days? Well, life is uh, completely different these days, that's for sure. Um, I got married a couple of years ago uh, to a woman that I met in the rooms. Um, so that's pretty pretty awesome. Never thought that was going to happen. I actually... Uh, about eight years ago, one of the guys that helped me get sober, he and I opened up uh, a treatment center together. Uh, so that's what we do. Um, so yeah, life is completely different, you know, and uh, not what I would have predicted. That's for sure. Like if you had given me a, a list of what would went on 10 years ago, none of the things that's going on today would have been on that list. That's for sure. So life is really good. That's so awesome. Uh, yeah. My mom passed away in January um, of last year, so that was uh, that was kind of difficult, you know. And uh, my wife and I've decided to to stay here with my dad, right, and just kind of do do whatever we can for him. So, yeah, life's different, that's for sure. You know, life is definitely different. Uh, but like I said, if if, if you would ask me ten years ago, like you know, oh, do you think that you would own a treatment center and uh, you know be married? I would have been like no what are you talking about not happening you know but it, this is what i'm doing and it's it, i love it love every minute of it that's awesome. yeah, things couldn't be better that is so awesome um sergio that's that's almost it for time thank you for having me and again guys i can't stress enough um how important i think you know putting stuff like this out there is not necessarily my story but just you know talking about recovery period um you know, we all, we all know the world is definitely shifting um, and social media is becoming more and more important and more of a mainstream way of people getting to know things and just taking away the stigma that comes along from, from being in recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think is a huge, huge thing and, and so vital for us to do. And I, I can't thank you guys enough for having me on.
Yes, Sergio. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we we put these we put these episodes out uh, in hopes that you know someone can relate, you know, can relate to your story, and uh, you know, hopefully, it leads them to recovery. So, just want to thank you again for joining us, and thank you for everything you're doing. You know, as they say, if the message hits one person, it helps one person. Then you've done your job, right? Yeah, absolutely, man. So, thank you again, guys. All right, guys, if you or someone you know is struggling, please reach out and ask for help. Thank you very much for listening. Bye.